First question, an 8-year-old child comes to the physician's office complaining of swelling and pain in the knees. His mother says the swelling occurred for no reason and it keeps getting worse. The initial diagnosis is Lyme disease. When talking to the mother and child, questions related to which of the following would be important to include in the initial history. So the swelling has occurred suddenly and it is getting worse and the initial diagnosis is Lyme disease and we have to find out the uh, which of the signs and symptoms should be included in the initial history that is which of the signs and symptoms which are the early signs and symptoms of the Lyme disease. So options uh, given are a decreased urine output and flank pain, B a fever of over 103 degree Fahrenheit over the last 2 to 3 weeks, C rashes over covering the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, D headache, malaise or sore throat. So the correct answer is option D headache, malaise or sore throat. So what is Lyme disease? Lyme disease is a tick-borne illness which is caused by the bacterium Borrelia burgdorferi. It is transmitted to humans through the bite of infected black leg ticks which is a vector-borne disease and Lyme disease it causes a rash which is often in bull's eye pattern and can cause flu-like symptoms. Joint pain and weakness in the limb can also occur without any previous injury or arthritis. And the stages of Lyme disease can be divided into three that is stage 1, stage 2 and stage 3. Stage 1 is called early localized Lyme disease. Here the bacteria have not yet spread throughout the body. Stage 2 is called the early disseminated Lyme disease. Here the bacteria have begun to spread throughout the body. And stage 3 is called the late disseminated Lyme disease. The bacteria have spread to distant sites such as the joints and nerves. So these are the three stages of Lyme disease. Coming to the symptoms of Lyme disease and the symptoms of stage 1 Lyme disease includes fever and chills, general ill feeling that is malaise, headache, joint pain, muscle pain and stiff neck and this is the rash that is a bull's eye pattern that is slowly enlarging red patch of the skin usually expanding to at least uh, 7 inches in diameter and there may be a flat or slightly raised red spot at the side of the tick bite. Often there is a clear area in the center or bull's eye appearance and this rash is called erythema migrans. Without treatment it can last several weeks and secondary patches may appear at distant sites. And the symptoms of stage 2 Lyme disease is numbness or main in the distribution of the nerve, paralysis or weakness in the muscle of the face, especially facial nerve palsy, meningitis, then heart problems such as skipped heartbeats which can cause lightheadedness or fainting. And the symptoms of stage 3 Lyme disease, it can occur months or years after the infection. The most common symptom is fluid accumulation in one or two large joints at a time that comes and goes over months. Knees are especially affected. Late Lyme disease can also cause neuropathy that is a numbness and pain in the peripheral nerves. So uh, coming to the treatment that is a 10 to 14 day course of antibiotics is used to treat people who are diagnosed with the early Lyme disease and the duration depends upon the choice of drug and the choice of antibiotic depends upon the stage of the disease and the symptoms and the common choices include doxycycline, amoxicillin, cefiroxin and azithromycin. Later stages of Lyme disease are also often treated with these same pill antibiotics for up to a month. Intravenous ceftriaxone is sometimes referred for refractory arthritis or neurologic disease. So these are regarding the Lyme disease. So in the question, correct answer is headache, malaise or sore throat. Next question, which of the following step is not included in the surgical safety checklist? Option A, timing. Option B, time out. C, sign in. D, sign out. Correct answer is option A, time in. So, WHO has developed this surgical safety checklist. The main aim of the surgical safety checklist is to reduce the errors and adverse events at the time of surgery and also to increase the communication and teamwork among the uh, persons who are involving in the surgery. 
so it is divided into three phases that is sign in time out and sign out so first one is a sign in it should be started before the induction of anesthesia and it should be done in the presence of the nurse and anesthetist so in sign in we have to check uh, some of the details that is first one we have to confirm the patient identity and the site of the surgery and the procedure that is going to be done and ensure that the, whether the consent is taken or not next we have to check whether the site is marked or not next one is anesthesia safety check should be completed the ssc guidelines recommend examination of the abcds that is the airway equipment breathing system including oxygen and inhalational agents suction drugs and devices and emergency medications and equipment and assistance all these should be available in uh, this anesthesia safety check should be completed next one is the pulse oximeter on the patient or functioning we have to ensure that the pulse oximeter is attached to the patient and it is functioning properly next one is the the patient have a non allergy ensure that the patient is uh, allergic to any medication next uh, have to check uh, whether, whether there is a uh, risk of aspiration or uh, or difficult airway and if s yes, make ensure that the equipment and assistance or equipment or assistance are available then also need to ensure whether it adequate intravenous access is available uh, that is during surgery there is a chance for the hypovolemic shock following blood loss in certain procedures so surgical team need to prepare large bore intravenous access for crystalloid or blood transfusions also ensure that the adequate blood is arranged so these uh, these are the uh, things that coming under the phase sign in the next phase is a time out that is it should be done before the first skin incision so in this first confirm all the team members have introduced themselves by name and role and surgeon anesthesia person sorry anesthesia professional and the nurse should verbally confirm the uh, patient identity site and the procedure that is going to be done next is the anticipated critical events uh, surgeons from the surgeons review what are the critical or unexpected steps that will happen and the uh, uh, operative du duration that is the duration of the surgery expected duration of the surgery and anticipated blood loss then and uh, from the part of the anesthesia team the anticipated critical uh, events is that are there any patient patient specific concerns and from the nursing team reviews um, has sterility been confirmed that is are there any equipment issues or any concerns and next is has antibiotic prophylaxis been given within the last 60 minutes so depending on part the specific drug and procedure antibiotics should be given less than 1 or 2 hours before skin incision otherwise antibiotics will not reach the current concentration in the blood patients treated with the antibiotics outside the correct time frame have similar rates of infection to those not given antibiotics at all so make sure that the antibiotic uh, has been given within the last 60 minutes and also make sure that whether any special uh, essential imaging is displayed or not so these are the things that are coming in the uh, phase time out the last one is a sign out that is it should be done before the patient leaves the operating room in this the nurse verbally confirms with the team the name of the procedure recorded then the instrument sponge and needle counts are correct make sure that the instrument sponge counts and needle counts are correct and how the specimen is uh, labeled that is include the patient name the nurse has to read out the name of the patient uh, and the specimen name of the patient which is written on the specimen and also check whether there are any equipment problems to be ad addressed surgeon anesthesia professional and nurse review the key concern for recovery and management of this patient so uh, these are the surgical safety checklist Next question all of the following are correct about WHO 5 hand hygiene moment except option A after touching the patient so it is one of the moment of hand hygiene uh, before touching the patient it is also coming in the hand hygiene moment before touching the patient surroundings 
it is not coming under the hand hygiene moment uh, answer is after touching the patient surroundings before doing in any procedure so in this the answer is option c before touching the patient surroundings so rest of the three are coming under the who five hand hygiene moments so let us see what are the who five hand hygiene moments first moment is before touching the patient second moment is before clean or aseptic procedure third moment after body fluid exposure risk fourth moment after touching the patient and fifth one is after touching patient surroundings so it is not before touching patient it is after touching patient surroundings next question after liver biopsy the patient should be placed in option a supine position b prone position c right lateral position d high fowler's position so after liver biopsy the patient should be placed in right lateral position so answer c is correct so during procedure of uh, liver biopsy uh, supine or left lateral to expose the right side of the upper abdomen so the position that should be maintained during the procedure of the liver biopsy is supine or left lateral in order to expose the right side of the upper abdomen and after the procedure we have to give right lateral position with a pillow or sandbag under the puncture site to decrease the risk of hemorrhage or bleeding and in lumbar puncture during procedure we have to use lateral position with the back board at the end of the table that is a c shaped position and after the procedure after the lumbar puncture procedure we have to uh, provide a supine position for the patient so uh, we have seen that for the liver biopsy during the procedure we have to provide supine or left lateral position and after the procedure we have to provide the right lateral position and in the lumbar puncture during the procedure we have to use the lateral position with the back board at the end of the table that is a c shaped position and after the procedure we have to uh, provide a supine position for the patient uh, and coming to the rail stoop Uh, what will be the position what are the important positions that were coming and coming in rights to feeding rights to in session let us see first one is a rights to feeding for rights to feeding we have to provide semi fowler's position and for rights to insertion we have to provide high fowler's position and if aspiration occurs after rights to feed we have to provide right side with head of the bed down uh, coming to the central line procedure at the time of insertion of central line we have to provide trendelenburg position that is during the time of insertion we have to provide trendelenburg position and at the time of removal we have to provide reverse trendelenburg position and trendelenburg position can be given in case of umbilical cord prolapse in pregnancy and for thrombophlebitis and case of anaphylactic shock and time of shock we can provide at a 20 degree angle trendelenburg position and case of reverse trendelenburg procedure it is usually do, uh, it is usually given in gard that is gastroesophageal reflux disease and uh, for thyroidectomy procedure after pneumonectomy uh, we will be positioning the patient on the operative side with the head slightly elevated and after infratendoral surgery supine position is recommended and after separate supratendoral procedure semi fowler's position is recommended and for cardiac catheterization the position that should be maintained is semi fowler's position and coming to the renal biopsy during procedure we have to provide prone position with the abdomen over the pillow and after procedure we should provide supine position for the patient and after myelogram in case of oil based dye we should provide supine position and water soluble based dye we should provide fowler's position so these are the important positions that uh, important uh, points from the topic position that will be usually asking in the nursing exam question. next question what is the best position to keep 12 year old child after a lumbar puncture to assess CS csf first option semi fowler so that the child can watch tv and be entertained option b supine position for several hours so as to prevent headache option c on the right side to prevent leak of csf option d prone for 2 hours to prevent vomiting and aspiration correct answer is supine position for several hours so as to prevent headache so during the procedure of lumbar puncture we have to provide lateral position or c shaped position near edge of the bed 
sitting position in which the another another uh, position is the sitting position in which the patient sit on the bed leaning on the cardiac table and feet supported on the flat surface and after the procedure place the client in supine position for 2 hours to prevent post lumbar puncture headache after that the play, uh, page, uh, after that place the patient in side lying or flat position to 2 to 3 hours uh, post procedure head then should not be elevated for 6 hours Next question, while administering the medicine, a nurse by mistakenly had a needle stick injury for which disease post-exposure prophylaxis is not required. Option A, Hepatitis B, B, Hepatitis C, C, Tetanus, D, HIV. Answer is Hepatitis C. For Hepatitis C, post-exposure prophylaxis is not required. Next question, a new nurse is caring for an adolescent in the trauma unit who has injury secondary to a motor vehicle accident. The nurse has started blood transfusion. After 30 minutes, client complains of nausea, headache, chills and muscle stiffness. An observing nurse should determine that the new nurse intervened properly, intervened appropriately when the new nurse took which action first. Option A. Obtained a set of vital signs. B. Called the primary healthcare provider. C. Flush the infusion tube with the normal saline and restarted the blood. D. Stop the transfusion. So the correct intervention is the stop the transfusion. So mainly three types of transfusion reactions are there. Allergic reactions, fibril reactions and uh, hemolytic reactions. Uh, first one is the hemolytic reactions. It occurs within first to 10 to 15 minutes of transfusion. And the signs and symptoms include shivering, headache, flank pain, increase in pulse rate and respiratory rate, hemoglobinuria, oliguria, sign of shock and renal failure. So it occurs within first to 10 to 15 minutes. Coming to the febrile reaction, it occurs within 30 minutes of blood transfusion and the signs and symptoms include chills, fever and muscle stiffness. Allergic reactions, it can occur during transaction till the end and the signs and symptoms include hives, wheezing, flushing, pruritis and joint pain. So, uh, this is a picture showing the blood transfusion reactions in detail. So, within minutes, an athletic reaction can occur within minutes. The reason is that IgA deficient patients make IgA antibodies that react with donor blood. And the signs include angioedema, hypotension and respiratory distress. And the treatment is fluids, epinephrine, vasopressors if needed. And within one hour, allergic reaction can occur. So, within minutes, an athletic reaction occurs. And within one hour, allergic reactions occurs. Reason is that the donor plasma interacts with the recipient IgE leads to mast cell activation and histamine release. And the signs include urticaria less severe than anaphylaxis. And the treatment is antihistamines consider restarting transfusion if symptoms resolve. Within one hour, Acute hemolytic transfusion reaction occurs and the reason is that EBO incompatibility leads to lysis of donor blood by preformed pre antibodies. Science includes fever and chills, flank pain, hemoglobinuria and DIC that is disseminated intravascular coagulation and the treatment is aggressive fluids, vasopressors and or diuretics if needed. Within 6 hours, febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction Reason is that release of cytokines from the leukocytes in donor blood. Signs, fever that is 1 to 2 degrees Celsius, increase in temperature from baseline and no vascular collapse. Treatment is antiparatics and supportive care. Within 6 hours, transfusion related acute lung injury that is trally, transfusion related acute lung injury can occur. Reason is that donor blood activates recipient neutrophils causing them to aggregate in pulmonary capillaries. Signs, respiratory distress, pulmonary infiltrates or chest x-ray. Treatment is oxygenation, mechanical ventilation if needed. So in all these transfusion reactions, we have to stop the infusion immediately and then inform to the doctor. And we have to replace all the IV tubings and IV cannula uh, that contains blood. And we have to ensure the patency of the IV line with only normal saline and monitor the vital signs and intake copper frequently strictly for the first 50 minutes of transfusion and usually transfusion reaction occurs within 50 ml of uh, blood transfusion. Next question, what is the recommended dose of adrenaline or epinephrine during 
neonatal resuscitation. Option A, 1 mg per kg body weight or 1 ml in 1 is to 1000 dilution. Option B, 0.1 mg per kg body weight or 0.1 ml in 1 is to 10,000. Option C, 0 0.01 mg per kg body weight or 0.1 ml in 1 is to 10,000. Option D, 0.5 mg per kg body weight or 0.1 ml in 1 is to 1,000. The correct answer is Option B, 0.1 mg per kg body weight that is 0.1 ml in 1 is to 10,000. So, coming to the neonatal resuscitation, the pyramid for newborn resuscitation, uh, first we have to uh, do thermoregulation that is drying, warming, positioning, suctioning and tactile stimulating. Then uh, coming to the airway and breathing, we have to provide oxygen to the newborn and if require back mask ventilation. Coming to circulation, provide chest compressions and sometimes in advanced cases, we will be intubating the newborn and will start medications. So, coming to the epinephrine dosage, in newborn we should not provide, um, we should not provide undiluted epinephrine to the newborn. We should provide diluted epinephrine to the uh, newborn. Normally, 1 gram of epinephrine in 1000 ml of solution means, that is the amount per unit of volume is 1 mg per ml. That is, this is the epinephrine injection, 1 mg per ml that is 1 gram of epinephrine in 1000 ml of solution. 1 gram of epinephrine in 1000 ml of solution that is 1 mg per ml. And in 1 is to 10,000 ratio for epinephrine, it represents 1 gram of epinephrine in 10,000 ml of solution that is 0.1 mg per ml. So, in newborn, we will be providing this 1 is to 10,000 ratio for ratio of epinephrine. And the uh, dosage is 0 0.5 to 0 0.1 mg per kg. So, the correct answer is 0.1 mg per kg body weight. Next question, which of the following is a first priority assessment in cardiac arrest? Option A, chest compression. Option B, check breathing. Option C, check airway. Option D, check consciousness. Answer is option D, check consciousness. So, uh, responsiveness of the patient is the first priority assessment in the cardiac arrest. So, identification of a cardiac arrest victim includes assuring a patient is unresponsive without central pulses and not breathing normally. Once a victim is identified, immediate CPR and activation of the emergency response system should be of priority. Next question, which of the following antibiotic is not required sensitivity test? Options a. Metronidazole, B. Meropenem, C. Cefaparazon, D. Amoxicillin. Answer is A. Metronidazole. Next question. A client with a cervical spine fracture at a C1 level has just arrived in the emergency room. The primary nursing intervention would be Option A. Stabilization of cervical spine. Option B. Airway assessment and stabilization. Option C. Confirmation of spinal cord injury. Option D. Normalization of intravascular volume. Answer is B. Airway assessment and stabilization. So, primary intervention is protection of the airway and adequate ventilation which is the first priority action. If sp cervical spine injury is suspected, the airway should be maintained using the jaw thrust method that also protects the cervical spine. All other interventions are secondary to the adequate ventilation. Next question. A client is being discharged with the arbitral and biclomethasone dipropanate to be administered through inhalation. 3 times a day and at bedtime. Client teaching regarding the sequential order in which the drugs should be administered includes Option A. Glucocorticoids followed by bronchodilator Option B. Bronchodilator followed by glucocorticoids Option C. Alternate successive administration Option D. According to the client's performance So, the client is discharged with the albuterol or otherwise it is known as salbutamol and biclomethasone, which is the glucocorticoid. So, in which sequence we have to take the medicine. So, in that first we have to take the bronchodilator, then it is followed by glucocorticoids. First we have to take albuterol, then biclomethasone. 
that is bronchodilators which will dilate the airways first and then allow for the glucocorticoid to be inhaled through open airways and increase the penetration of the steroid for maximum effectiveness of the drug. So the correct answer is option B bronchodilator followed by glucocorticoids. Next question, which of the following is an indication of phototherapy in a newborn with a hyperbilirubinemia? Option A, bilirubin level 12.5 mg per deciliter. Option B, bilirubin level 20 mg per deciliter. Option C, bilirubin level 15 mg per deciliter. Option D, bilirubin level 22 mg per deciliter. Answer is bilirubin level 15 mg per deciliter. We have to start phototherapy uh, in time neonates if the total cerebral rubin is more than 15 mg per deciliter. And in pre time if the cerebral rubin level is more than 12 mg per deciliter, we have to start the phototherapy. And if the bill ribbon level is more than 5 mg per deciliter within 24 hours, in that case also we have to start the phototherapy. If the uh, hebilirubin level is more than 15 mg per deciliter and the age of the newborn is between 25 to 48 hours, we have to start the phototherapy. And if it is more than 20 mg per deciliter, we have to consider for the exchange transfusion. And if the new age of the newborn is between 49 to 72 hours and the bilirubin level is more than 18, we have to consider the phototherapy. And if it is more than 25, consider for exchange transfusion. And the age of the newborn is more than 72 hours and uh, build to level is more than 20. We have to start the phototherapy. Next question. Which of the following electrolytes should monitor in a patient with a congestive heart failure receiving digoxin and fruzimide? Option A. Sodium. B. Calcium. C. Potassium. And D. Zinc. Answer is C. Potassium. So, uh, the patient's uh, who are receiving digoxin hyperkalemia in those patients hyperkalemia can lead to digoxin toxicity so we have to monitor the value of potassium next question during cpr the rescuers should change their position every three minutes or after two cycles of cpr every two minutes or after five cycles of cpr every five minutes or after two cycles of cpr every one minute or, or after two cycles of cpr Correct answer is every 2 minutes or after 5 cycles of CPR. So, the rescuers should change positions every 5th cycle or approximately 2 minutes. Interrupting chest compressions interrupts circulation. During CPR, blood flow is provided by chest compressions. Rescuers must be sure to provide effective chest compressions and minimize any interruption of chest compression. So, the rescuers should change positions every 5th cycle or approximately 2 minutes. So, in 2 percent CPR, the rescuers should change roles after about 5 cycles. So, the answer is, the during CPR, the rescuers should change their position every 2 minutes or at the 5th cycle of the CPR.